So hello everybody and welcome to this Bradford Literature Festival event, Why It's Great to Be a Baby. Um, this event is in partnership with Better Start Bradford for Baby Week Bradford 2020. So we're thrilled to welcome Casper Adiman uh, to the festival today. Casper is a developmental psychologist, he's the director of Goldsmith Infant Lab and he's the author of The Laughing Baby and he's also a Yorkshireman as we've just found out originally from York so I'm um, very happy to welcome him back to Yorkshire today. Um, so all I'm going to do now is hand over to Casper and he's going to start his presentation and um, you will only hear from me again if Casper needs me, but fingers crossed we won't. So welcome. Hi to Casper. Uh, right. Thanks, George. And uh, thanks, uh, Kelly and uh, everyone at Baby Week Bradford for organising this event. I'm very pleased to be able to give this talk. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a little bit, little bit different from what we normally hear about, about babies. So it's like, um, it's a celebration of babies uh, today and answering the question, um, why, why are we even babies and why is it great to, to be a baby? Um, so as uh, George said, let's get back to my presentation. Let, there we go. George says, I've just recently um, I finished writing a whole book about uh, why it's great to be a baby. Um, and about sort of the joy that babies seem to have being babies. Um, it's something I noticed in 15 years of studying babies, that they seem to have a tremendously great time doing that. Um, and so I wrote a book, came out in April, unfortunately under lockdown, um, so we didn't get to have a, a launch party or anything. But today I'm gonna to like tell you some of the, the things I discovered um, in the process of um, writing that. Um, and if I wanted to sum up the whole talk, I think I could do it probably um, in two um, nice short quotes. Um, so the first is from uh, this guy, Donald Winnicott, um, who was um, one of the founders of, the, of attachment theory, who's like um, very influential in our understanding of the relationship between a mother and a baby. Um, and this very famous quote from him is that there, there is no such thing as a baby, there is a baby and someone. Um, and that, you know, is, as we'll see as we go through, um, is really, really key to sort of thinking about what babies are doing. Um, they, don't, they don't get there alone. And um, a lot of what being a baby about is about is about its relationships with other people. Um, the second quote comes from uh, this guy, and don't worry, it's not Nigel Farage. Uh, this is uh, Victor Borg, who is a Danish comedian and uh, musician, and he has the best possible quote about what laughter is all about. Um, laughter isn't about jokes. Laughter is the shortest distance between two people. It's the way that you connect with a stranger. It's the way that uh, if you get off a boat on, on the other side of the world, um, you know, the one thing you can do to sort of um, connect as an equal with somebody is to laugh. And that also works with babies, that um, you know, before they can speak, babies are able to smile and laugh within the first few months of life. Um, and that is really key to this thing that there's no such thing as a baby, how they connect with other people. So that's the whole talk, um, but let's go into a bit more detail um, about it. Um, and just sort of, what we're going to be doing is sort of discovering why it is we have this really um, long period of infancy. What does that what does that mean? Um, you know, if you don't think about other animals, um, you know, a giraffe, a baby giraffe can walk within uh, a few minutes of being born, and that's a giraffe, which is a pretty tricky business. You know, walking when you're a giraffe, um, and many other animals, you know, they're um, pretty competent pretty quickly. We're um, amazingly incompetent as infants. Um, we have this long infancy. What, what is that all about? Um, and what is it giving us? What do we gain from it? Then tell you uh, why um, I pick laughing babies as the way to, to look at this. Um, and then a few lessons for us as adults um, where that um, we should Think about some quite big picture issues when we're when we're uh, looking at what what we can gain from these babies. 
Um, and we'll have, this should take about uh, another 25 minutes. And then we've got a good half hour um, for your questions um, and hopefully some answers as well. Um, so um, for an audience like this, I don't think I need to um, say too much that um, being a baby is um, sort of the training montage of, of the superhero powers that, that adults and humans have. Um, you know, humans are capable of all sorts of amazing skills that just aren't seen anywhere else in the animal kingdom. Um, and those first two years of life um, is where the foundations of everything that comes next is being, being built. So our ability to run around, our fine motor control, um, yeah, it's uniquely things like you, uh, like um, uh, language um, and sort of understanding the minds of others. Um, so those those first two years are, yeah, I think everybody in this virtual room will understand that they are sort of absolutely fundamental to everything. Um, yeah, just to to recap, it's sort of like this is a surprisingly slow process. So we do start off you know, very helpless and, and largely asleep for the first three months. We're, um, we're definitely born too early, it seems. You know, we, we could do with a bit more time in the womb. Obviously, that's not possible. Um, but by around, so this now baby is uh, around 11 months, uh, a year. Hey, what are you doing? And now we've got very, you know, determined, purposeful behavior now. Hey, what are all these little this, doing on the floor? This baby's got a plan. Uh, it's got amazing yeah. fine motor control. They're having a great time doing whatever it is they're doing. What are you doing? Um, and they're probably no learning quite a lot in this um, process too. Um, and then by, by around two years, we're, at least in their minds, they're, they're fully grown up. They, they, they don't see much of a difference between them and us. Uh, Can you say Axton? Now say Raiden. <laughs> say Daddy. 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 Say Grandma. Ma. Say Carson. <laughs> say Ashley. Daddy. <laughs> I love you. By two years old, once language is kicking in, yeah, within this relatively short period, they've um, yeah become uh, full, not quite equal members of our families and uh, uh, the human human race. But they they've they've got all the basics mastered, and it's really um, quite incredible. <laughs> talk about those sorts of milestones today. I think um, many of you will actually be more familiar with sort of a lot of those steps than I am. What I want to talk to you about is um, what's behind all of this? Why do we have this long infancy period? And for this, I think we need to go back to a different kind of origin story. Yeah, so now um, let's look at the origins of being a baby through a different lens and go back to um, the origins of humankind. Two million years um, you know, ago, we were living in small bands on the African savanna, um, sort of the uh, anatomically modern humans emerged between that time and about 150,000 uh, years ago. 
Um, and over that time, sort of our lifestyle wasn't too different from these people. These are the Hazda tribe in uh, Gambia, who are hunter-gatherers living a relatively nomadic lifestyle um, in small groups, um, combining uh, you know, a, a lifestyle with some, some hunting of other animals and quite a lot of, of, of foraging behaviors, um, living in extended family groups. Um, and, you know, Although they are you know, completely as modern as we are, a lot of their lifestyle gives us a clue as to what um, our lifestyle would have been like for much of that two million year period, which is really foundational to what has made us human. Uh, and when we dig into this, we see a lot of the answers to um, why, we, why we are babies and why we are the way we are. Um, let's start by uh, looking at sort of well, the key thing about that was that we lived in these very large, our brains, so this, it, this plot shows, um, shows from 10 million years ago, you'll see that from two, 2 million years ago, just something about our lives, our brains just shot off into uh, um, yeah, expanded at a tremendous rate. Um, and this seems to be connected with um, the expansion of the size of the groups that we live in. So these little diagrams here gives you some sort of clue as to why that is. The bigger um, the group that you live in, sort of the more complicated life is, the more possible connections there are between individuals. Um, and within a group, a lot of what's involved is um, keeping track of that. And this seems to have been a really key um, um, driver for um, language and, as it turns out, for laughter. Um, so um, the Oxford evolutionary psychologist Robin Dunbar has proposed this theory that um, uh, our hominids living in these groups of um, 50 to 150, that was absolutely key to our science survival and uh, thriving as a species. Um, and this is also what led to our brains ballooning up to this size. So we survived and thrived through this cooperation as a group. Um, and one really key driver within that is um, that you need to be cohesive as a group. So you have to keep track of all the dynamics um, um, of what's going on. Now in chimpanzees and, and other great apes, the way that they sort of keep their um, alliances together is by grooming each other. Chimpanzees spend a lot of their time every day uh, just uh, picking fleas off each other, but not because they want to pick off fleas, but to invest in their friendship. It's literally, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Um, and as our group size grew too big, uh, bigger, we weren't able to sort of maintain that with all of the, the people we interacted with e each day. We needed an alternative um, uh, means of sort of socially bonding. Robin Dunbar proposes that um, because things like laughter um, and um, just sort of sharing emotional sort of noises can be from one person to many, this is a good um, mechanism uh, to uh, connect with other people. So the way that we bonded with the group um, and the way that language evolved was um, through gossiping amongst each, go gossiping with each other, sort of recounting sort of the dramas of the day, um, initially quite probably without any words at all, but in quite a, um, uh, a schematic language through sharing of emotional highs and lows. Um, and that this sort of mixture of being a big group and having a way to communicate really drove the size of our brains. Um, so laughter is right there at the heart of the story. And um, babies are right there at the heart of the story too. Because another big driver for our giant brains um, is the fact that that's actually quite a, a tricky thing um, to maintain. So uh, my uh, friend Celeste Kidd and her husband Steve P. and Dotsi have done a little study where they've um, looked at um, uh, what it means to uh, look after your infants. And they sort of propose that um, 
to look after these helpless infants, um, you need a big brain to be able to do that. If your baby is born helpless, um, you're going to need a lot of intelligence to be able um, to care for it. Um, and this has this quite interesting positive feedback loop, because if you need a bigger brain, um, you can't give birth to a bigger and bigger brain baby. The, um, the birth canal, the pelvis restricts the size of the baby's head. So actually, that brain growth has to happen after birth. And so babies are born increasingly helpless um, relatively. So um, as we sort of saw that first three months of babies um, mostly asleep, often called the fourth trimester, um, is a direct consequence of um, these evolutionary um, choices that our species made that we were going to give birth to very helpless babies um, earlier than we really should have been born. Um, there are some estimates that if a human uh, pregnancy was as long as a chimpanzee pregnancy relatively uh, to the size of the brain, we would be giving birth after about 18 or 19 months pregnancies, which nobody, nobody uh, who's given birth would, would, would want to do that. Um, and you know, anatomically, it wouldn't be possible. What it means, we've got very helpless babies. We need intelligent, uh, clever um, parents who are going to um, be able to look after um, a helpless baby. It's a very challenging thing to look after a baby. Um, but amazingly, um, uh, this uh, giving birth to these helpless babies creates this feedback loop demanding that uh, parents are more intelligent. So, so helpless babies were sort of part of the um, core part of the story for why um, humans succeeded. We, we, um, we had to have um, this long period of infancy for us to be as intelligent as we are. And that in itself drove part of our intelligence. So we have our babies to thank for our amazing intelligence. And uh, it doesn't stop there, actually. So Kristen Hawkes is uh, an anthropologist, and she studied the Hasdard tribe. Um, and she also studied um, a tribe called the Kung in uh, South uh, um, Africa, um, and looked at um, the um, uh, behaviors of grandmothers in both of these two, two groups, and discovered that they were very different. So in the... Um, um, the Hazda group, uh, the grandmothers actually um, take an equal part in foraging. They work very hard in the fields, um, hunting for um, and digging out these uh, um, uh, tubers that uh, are a very st starchy main part of the, the diet. In the Kung, the grandmothers are primarily um, involved in looking after um, grandchildren uh, while mothers are going out doing foraging. Um, and Kristen Hawkes realized that this is a, a conscious strategy within um, our species to um, invest wisely in your children's children. So you do the thing that's best for your children's children. Um, and this made her realize that actually the, the grandmother and particularly the maternal grandmother is a really key driver in um, the story of, of our success. Um, so uh, this is why we have the menopause, that um, it seems that um, as a species we've chosen to invest um, in our children's children as a way to um, pass our genes on effectively. Um, and this is also what's given rise to our amazing longevity relative to other species of, like chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, so the longer um, uh, we live, um, the more grandchildren and great-grandchildren that um, we can care for and that we can pass on our genes to. Um, and as we pass on those genes, we're passing on the, 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 um, the genes for longevity. Um, so everyone gets to benefit from um, our grandmother's choices here. Um, and part of what they're, they're choosing to do is to help with supporting this, um, uh, these infants. Um, and uh, you know, one very direct bit of evidence for this was a, a study quite recently um, that looked in uh, rural Gambia, uh, similar to where this tribe has to live, um, found that toddlers with a maternal grandmother 
um, twice as likely to survive as those who um, did not. And actually the presence or absence of a father made no difference whatsoever to that, showing just how key this was in our sort of um, evolutionary past. So that's sort of um, a delve into the past and let's just recap that um, uh, key within this was this expansion of our social groups. Um, laughter and language were part of the glue that held those groups together um, and were responsible for this um, ballooning in the size and complexity of our brain, not um, to be able to go hunting and sort of um, survive in that sense, but actually to be able to get on with um, the other members of our, of our group. Um, the cost of a bigger brain was uh, a longer infancy and a greater investment in parental care. Um, it also is a greater um, range of skills that you need to learn as a baby. So looking at it from the baby's point of view, um, there's a lot to learn in that period. Um, it also in leads to um, us investing in our children's children. Um, so long live grandmothers, which um, leads to us all being long lived. Um, and one other thing I hadn't mentioned before is that obviously that, that those long lived members of society, um, especially in a, a nomadic free literate society are passing on a huge amount of cultural knowledge as well. Um, which again, is gonna be absolutely key for your survival. Um, so all of that, um, the little baby is really at the center of the story. Um, now, obviously our world has changed dramatically since 150,000 years ago. The, this is the, the latest number uh, of uh, people that there are on, on the planet. And you know, in the life of a baby, you won't meet all of those, but you will meet hundreds, if not thousands of imaginary um, sort of uh, characters as well. And so we have an incredibly complex uh, world that we're facing. Um, and we're doing it with the actual dynamics of our society changing quite a lot that we're now in smaller families, much more dependent upon uh, just our immediate nuclear family. Um, but that the sort of the core of um, there being no such thing as a baby hasn't changed. The, um, in fact, perhaps even more so, the baby is you know, directly dependent upon uh, the immediate caregivers. Um, and um, if we look at um, what it is that babies are getting from uh, caregivers, one really key thing um, is just connection, human uh, understanding other humans. Um, and this is uh, something that uh, a researcher from Edinburgh called um, Paul Winter Rathen um, calls co-presence and synchrony and has studied in great detail this um, a link um, between a, uh, an adult and a baby and you really sort of see that a lot of what babies are trying to learn from us is um, the, the way that you interact with anybody else. So they're from the very beginning, um, the very first day of life, uh, mothers are already, or even before that actually, but um, the, um, from the very first day of life, mothers and babies are having conversations. When a, a mother is feeding a baby, um, the pauses and the way that she responds to a baby um, is turn-taking. Um, and almost all our interactions with babies have an element of this. Uh, in my research, I've been asking people about pet, um, laughter in all its forms. The most popular form of laughter all over the world is this one. And this game is really all about the connection um, between you and, and a baby. And this is why it is the most popular and successful game all over the world. Um, you know, this is interaction stripped down to, to conversation stripped down to its um, basics. And it's all about eye contact as well. So that conversation is not all about the words. It's about this co-presence. Um, within developmental psychology, we have a very famous 
uh, demonstration um, that shows this oppositely called the still face paradigm. Um, we use this um, in studies where you need to get the baby a little bit agitated um, and to sort of just to show how much a baby is in tune um, with this connection from a parent. Um, so the core of being a baby um, is about learning um, to be this um, social being that we are. Um, there's one other um, amazing thing that we owe to babies that I think it's probably worth um, mentioning here. And this is the work of an anthropologist called Ellen Disenyanki, who studied um, the origin of art and started out looking at um, the rituals that um, uh, hunter-gatherer tribes would do um, and sort of saw these as a way, um, so dances, um, paintings and things like this, a way of um, socially bonding as a group. Um, but as she looked deeper into it, she, um, um, she um, thought it goes a little bit um, more than that, than actually all of those type of connections um, are really a reiteration or a, a version um, of the relationship between a mother and her baby. Um, so all over the world uh, have developed these nodes of culture that we call ceremonies and rituals, which do for their members what mothers naturally do for their babies, engage their interests, involve them in a shared rhythmic pulse, and instill in, uh, thereby instill feelings of closeness and community. So art, is a way of sharing emotion between two people. It's connecting your experience to somebody else. And this, uh, Ellen Disney says, grows out of something that a parent is naturally doing for their baby. They're trying to um, bring them this sense of shared emotion and a shared feeling. Um, so we owe babies our long life, um, our intelligence, and even um, all forms of art. And probably the earliest form of art, therefore, was mothers singing to their babies. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen this video before, um, but this really does illustrate um, that um, yeah, babies are incredibly emotional beings in this day. Sing you a song? You want me to sing a song, honey? <laughs> Let me know how you feel about the song, okay? I don't want you to come out here no more. I beg you for mercy. You don't know how strong my weakness is, or how much it hurts me. Cause when you see it's over with her, I want to believe it's true. So I let you in, knowing tomorrow I'm gonna wake up missing you, wake up missing you when the one you love's in love with someone else. We we 
better stop that one there. It is, it is um, emotionally powerful just watching that baby. Um, I also got a chance to write a song with a baby, or I got to help write one. This is Imogen Heap. Um, she just finished writing the music to Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Um, and then we were connected with her to help write a song that would make um, uh, babies happy. Uh, so um, we, we consulted in the lab. We got babies to come and help discover which were the most, um, the, the, the tunes Imogen composed would they respond to the most. Um, and the happy song, which you can find on YouTube, um, has had uh, millions and millions of views in the few years it's been there. So I think um, we've uh, succeeded on that. Um, just sort of, uh, therefore, I think adding to our diagram, we should really make uh, uh, art and the connection to each other um, part of this story too. Um, so laughter and emotion are sort of what we're sharing with babies, but are they happy themselves? And what can we say about that? Well, they have their ups and their downs. Um, I think overall babies are happier than us. It's, it's very hard to sort of um, uh, quantify that. Um, and what I'm, not, what I'm going to do today is not actually um, try and do that in a, in a measurement of, of, of babies. I'm going to take it in a sort of a more abstract sense. Um, I have done one study that looked at babies' happiness. I actually uh, did a study where we looked at um, how babies were in the morning. And they, uh, um, we discovered that 80% of babies were, wake up extremely happy every morning, which um, is not something that happens to me and uh, certainly was a bit of a surprise. Um, and, but yeah, now let's, let's sort of look at it more abstractly. And um, this is uh, Michal Csikszentmihalyi, who has studied in adults, the sort of the core of what makes uh, adults happy and looked in cases of um, all sorts of walks of life, the people who are most satisfied with their life um, were able to achieve something called flow. It's a state of being very absorbed in what you're doing. Um, and it uh, exists because it's in this sweet spot of um, challenging your own abilities, um, but not challenge them so far that it becomes too difficult. So some, if something is beyond your level of skill, um, the, cha the challenge too hard it's, uh, makes you anxious, it's too difficult. If it's something that's below your level of skill, um, it's going to leave you bored. Um, but in this middle, um, you're, um, you've got a, a good challenge. And um, the, the summary of many years of research from uh, Chisak Mahali is that people who maintained uh, happiness and contentment throughout life were always able to challenge themselves. They were always able um, to find new things to improve on and whatever they were doing. Um, and uh, he didn't do very much work research with babies, but um, it kind of, I think, will be all of our experience that this is something that just comes naturally um, every day of their life to babies. Um, they are constantly pushing the, the boundary of what they understand, um, and they're constantly mastering new skills. So there is a, a, a deep contentment uh, sort of built into um, the life of being a baby. Um, and that constant challenge also sort of has a, um, a different perspective that we can look at it. Um, I'm a baby scientist, I'm a bit biased, and I often say that um, babies are little scientists. Um, but some of my colleagues go a bit further and they would say that, no, actually, it's not that scientists, uh, babies are little scientists, it's actually scientists um, are big kids. Um, so what really came first was this curiosity. Um, and so this is um, something put forward by Alison Gopnik. What really came first was this curiosity about the world, this need to teach yourself lots of um, uh, things through a process of trial and error. Um, and the um, science was actually um, society learning to um, adapt that approach in a systematic way. Um, and so 
Um, what science is, is really um, just a reiteration of um, what we see in cognitive development. And this builds on things like uh, John Dewey and Jean, Jean Piaget um, would have said earlier on in uh, uh, that century as well. Um, and actually, it goes a little bit further than this. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with this man. He, he's perhaps the cleverest man in Britain at the moment, uh, Professor Carl Friston. Uh, he's grown up with a very uh, terrifyingly complicated theory of everything um, about how the brain works. Um, and um, probably at the moment, the only person that understands this theory in its entirety is Carl Friston. Um, but it's becoming over the last decade, a sort of the key idea behind what the brain is doing and what um, uh, it is about trying to understand the world. I'm not gonna go into any of it, any detail about it, um, but um, I think we can, it can be summarized quite uh, nicely um, in this one a little phrase that the whole point of life is to be prepared for what comes next. Um, and what the brain is doing and what we're doing in all learning is um, exploring the world well enough that we're prepared for um, the a, a event around the next horizon. Um, and so this maps uh, quite nicely onto um, babies' uh, everyday experience. And so that's pretty much everything. I just want to finish with one other kind of deep uh, philosophical point about contentment. So for two and a half thousand years, um, Buddhists um, have um, been trying to achieve this state of um, pure contentment, uh, acceptance of the world. This is a date of Nirvana. And the way that they do this is through um, meditation. And meditation is just sitting still, trying really hard to be present in the moment. Um, the, the secret of uh, uh, the Buddha and all sort of schools of meditation is no secret at all. It's not some complicated um, process. It's just um, being able to be completely aware of what's happening to you right at the moment and be um, not distracted by the past uh, and the future. Now that's obviously easier said than done. Um, and meditation is a training to help you um, be more connected with the present. Um, and, you know, I'm sort of perhaps overreaching a little bit here, but I like to think that perhaps this is something that comes very naturally um, to babies. Is pretty much everything I have to say. Let's just recap that infancy is the training montage for all our superpowers. Um, the reason we are, we were babies, and the reason that babies sort of are central to the story goes back to our hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And it is all about um, being part of these big social groups um, and being needing to be a, a member of those groups. Um, babies are also part of the origin of the story of our intelligence, our art, our science, um, and um, the reason that curiosity is absolutely key um, to being human, um, and that there is no such thing as a baby. Um, this all happens um, 
with the support of um, the, you know, the, the care uh, and love that um, parents uh, and the sort of immediate family can provide. Um, so thanks to so many people who've been involved in my research over the years, um, and uh, especially to all the babies and parents who've come to the lab to take part in these studies. Um, yeah, if you want to read a longer version of this, that's uh, The Laughing Baby. Uh, and a shorter uh, version uh, is on YouTube. Um, and now let's, yeah, let's have some uh, questions and answers. And yeah, for this, I think if I uh, maybe stop sharing the screen and let's see what questions we've, we've had um, come through so far. Can you tell us whether there's any link between happy babies and adult character and disposition? Um, and the short answer is that no, there isn't really. Um, none that's stable enough that we can detect it um, in infancy. Um, and actually, even within infancy, um, there isn't, there is quite a, a change that happens um, between the first year and the second year that, um, if you find the babies who are the happy babies um, in the, um, at eight months, it isn't a great um, predictor, isn't a sort of incredibly reliable predictor of how they will be at two years. And then that um, disposition at two years um, really um, isn't telling you much um, about um, five years. Um, and actually, it goes on further than that through your whole life. The, a recent study um, looked at uh, a people who filled in a questionnaire when they were 15, um, and it followed them back um, 63 years later when they were in their 70s. And there was no correlation between people's personality at 15 uh, and the adults they turned out to be, or the grandparents they turned out to be in their 70s. Um, so there are, you know, there are some continuities, um, but there's also a lot of change that will happen with everyone. And a lot of that, I think, comes down to the experiences um, that uh, you have. So is there a link between babies, when babies begin laughing and vocabulary in toddler years and beyond? Um, uh, no, uh, so we, we haven't done a um, direct sort of prospective study of this, and I don't think it's a question that gets asked um, in um, language studies. Um, so there is quite a wide range of when first laugh uh, happens between anywhere between the first, a couple, you know, um, some people will say within the, you know, within the first month up to um, six or seven months. Um, typically around three or four months, um, but um, I've not seen anything that then links that to um, vocabulary, um, at least not directly. Aha, what do I think about baby signing and language development? Um, yes, that's it, that is a good question. Um, I think I, uh, encountered this um, when, uh, when I was writing the book. Actually, what you really need here is um, my colleague from Goldsmiths, um, Evan Mercure, who has studied um, uh, parents, uh, the, uh, the hearing children of parents who are deaf. So they are children who learn um, genuine British Sign Language and um, spoken language at the same time. And um, in that research, they find that actually um, the, um, uh, the two um, can happen in parallel. So when, you, when, you're, when you're learning two spoken languages, it can often mean that there's, there's a bit of a, a delay to how quickly um, you, uh, you acquire both of them because you're sort of juggling these two things. Um, but when you were learning a, a sign language and a, and a spoken language, 
um, it really uh, uh, didn't delay either of those. And so um, I think there were probably quite a few parallels as to um, the fact that um, baby signing is not going to be detrimental. Um, so if parents want to do that, um, it's, yeah, it can help. Um, it doesn't, I don't think it will speed up language development, um, but what it might help with is um, infants who are, are frustrated by their inability to communicate. So ba babies can communicate earlier with Makaton. Um, and um, so I, I think the, the benefit would come um, not in speeding up language itself, um, but in um, sort of getting over some of those communication difficulties if they're present. Now that I've written the book, what are the next avenues for your research? What questions did the book raise for you? Um, yeah, so the, the main journey I went on from, from doing the book was to thinking that infancy was all about cognitive development, to realizing that actually that, that sort of unfolds um, under its own steam. And it's the, it's the emotional development that's really um, the bit where we as adults can, can provide the most um, benefit to infants. Um, and so a lot of my new research is looking at that. I'm doing more research on um, uh, music. So I've got PhD students who are studying what it is that babies respond to in the emotion of music. Um, and I'm also looking at um, trying um, in, uh, just from watching videos of a mother and baby interacting, how much you can tell about the quality of their relationship. Um, so I've got a, a big collaborative project with partners in Africa and India um, trying to um, get a bit more understanding of if there's subtle sort of nonverbal cues in, a, in an interaction um, that tells you something. The research you described on the importance of grandparents was interesting. Do you think uh, there will be an impact as families become more geographically diverse? Um, yes, yeah, so there's a big leap between uh, the, um, the environment and the, the family uh, dynamics in uh, a hunter-gatherer tribe, where obviously not just grandparents, but um, cousins and older siblings and the community at large are all, um, uh, having a, a daily contact with, with uh, babies and young children. And now we're, um, we're looking at things where, yeah, the, the, the most of the contact comes from uh, your nursery group, um, from your immediate family. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, it's very hard to sort of map from one to the other. Um, and, um, you know, I think, more we would like to think about it from that we know how valuable that relation is for grandparents and babies. Um, and so whenever it's possible, it's a great thing to have. Um, but as we do all sort of live this very different world, um, the fact that it isn't, isn't that we're necessarily missing out on something. Um, it's, um, you know, it's just a sad fact of, of our lives these days. Do you feel that COVID and the reduction in social interaction will have a long-term effect on baby development? Um, I think it can go two ways because um, in some cases, this has meant that babies have had more sort of close contact and extended contact um, with, um, with their parents. Um, and I, so I think for the youngest babies, it's probably, we're not gonna see a negative impact. I think the real, impact would be on toddlers and, um, and above where, um, yeah, the, the, the likelihood is that, you know, um, first of all, they, you know, being trapped in the house with limited contact with other people um, is very, very challenging for, for the families. 
and that stress is going to come out in their lives. Um, and also, yeah, just the lack of the, that social social contact at the period when, um, uh, as a as a preschooler, that is a large part of what you're you're trying to learn to learn to interact with peers. So babies, they play in parallel to other babies. They don't really need the contact with other babies, but by the time you're two, that you know, that is a huge part of what um, social contact comes. And so I think, yeah, um, they're going to be the hardest hit. Um, are there any cultural differences relation to laughing with babies? Um, yes, so this this is this is true and something that um, I um, would like to um, uh, investigate further. Um, I um, I feel like I need would need to actually um, visit those cultures to to get a proper sense of it. Um, so I know that in um, in many African cultures, the the baby is sort of it's always present, but it's often um, ignored. Um, and then, um, you know, what what that translates to in terms of laughter uh, in the day, I you know, I'd like to actually be able to get um, sort of. Uh, naturalistic recordings to be able to get some sense of that and so uh, not something I've been able to do uh, yet. What makes something funny for a baby? Yes that's a great question um, and uh, the way I often get asked is like what makes how what's the best way to make a baby laugh um, and the best way to make a baby laugh is to take them seriously, it's to try and connect with them. So um, this is what you know, the core of infant laughter is not at funny things. It's to share their sort of happiness with the situation um, with a person. Um, and so you'll see this if you try and be funny with a baby, um, they probably won't have it. You know, they actually won't put up with. Um, you know, someone just trying to enforce, like, look at this, uh, really in their face. Um, where they really warm up and respond is to the person who um, is much more cautious in the way they approach the baby, um, who's letting, watching to see where the baby leads the interaction. Um, and the laughter will just flow from the fact that you're giving the baby attention. Um, so hopefully that's an answer um, to that. Uh, there's more in the book as well. And last question, yeah, as a musician and music lover, I'm really interested in the emotional power of music. Uh, how did you go about determining what would be a happy song for babies? Uh, we just played them little snippets of the song. Um, so Imogen composed four different uh, uh, melodies and we played them at two different tempos with and without uh, singing. Um, so our babies come into our lab, they listen to all of these and so we filmed their reaction, uh, we got their parents to tell us which they, was, uh, which they liked. One of those melodies was much more popular than all the others, so Imogen took that melody um, and expanded it into the song and then we got the babies back and they did two versions we played them two versions of the song and discovered, do they like the chorus or not? Do they like the slightly faster version or the slightly slower version? Um, and um, there's actually, a, there, we do have a, a little video on how we made the happy song. So maybe I'll share that um, in the follow up as well. Okay, well, thanks everyone and, uh, and bye for now. <laughs>